You're listening to the 2019 Nelson Arts Festival Page and Blackmore Puka Puka Talks. This session features Witi Ihamaira in conversation with Guyon Espina. Kia ora koto. Uh, welcome to Page and Blackmore Puka Puka Talks. As you will all know, this is a new name for the Readers and Writers Program as part of the Nelson Arts Festival. And it was part of our wish to really embrace Te Reo and um, be more inclusive and diverse in our program. And so that's why I'm especially delighted um, to have Witi Ihamara here for today's session and in conversation with none other than Guy and Espina. I'm going to hand over to Guy in a minute to introduce, when they come on stage, to introduce uh, Witty. Just a few housekeeping things first. Um, my name is Kerry Sunderland. I'm the Puka Puka Talks coordinator. Any questions or feedback, come and see me afterwards. I'd love to hear from you. If you haven't already, could you please turn off your phones or put them on silent? We did have one in the middle of our first session today, so it's great if you can turn them off. Um, I wanted to let you know that we're recording this session for a podcast, which will be available on the Nelson Arts Festival YouTube channel um, in some time before Christmas, probably, I'd say. And um, when we come, there will be time for questions towards the end of the session. Uh, we'll be passing around this mic. It's a roving mic. And if you are asking a question, please treat it like an ice cream. Keep it really close to your mouth and, um, and speak into it. That would be great. And um, I want to say a big thank you to Paige and Blackmore for making this um, possible um, by sponsoring Puka Puka Talks. And of course, there will be copies of Native Son available for sale and I think a couple of other of Witty's books. Um, and he will be happy to sign them and chat to you after the session. So now it's my great pleasure to welcome to the stage Guy on Espina and Witty Ihamara. Please give him a round of applause. No, my Heidi, my Piki, my Kaki, my Ngamihi, or Tiahiahi, Tena Tato, call a fucker out with a mai, rather with the two and we all Tane Faka Piri Piri Kayaku Nui, Kayaku Rahi, Kayaku Rangatira, Tena Kaito, Kato, Koto Tato, Kaipapa Korido, Hangayana, Kitake, Matahia Poki, Aukia, Tato, Kato, Ara, Kitty Fakanui, Tamahi, uh, Witi Ihamaira, Itarangatira, Kokwete. Manuaraki or te whakataka pōkai o te kau papa o koe hi. te te rākau karamatamata o te rākau taumata uh, hei kai tohu te te I, I, te, I te ara ki ngā wainui o te reo you are the supreme commander <laughs> the, uh, I hope you can live up to this it doesn't sound quite as good in English um, <laughs> you are the supreme commander at the, the apex of the tree leading us through the rough waters of the language so I hope you can oh. live up to this God, uh, do I have to talk now well, because you were so beautiful? <laughs> I'm just going to nip out the back and leave you for the next hour, actually. Um, I've never been called a Supreme Commander before, I must say, you know, but um, it's, it's, it's been an amazing career because, as you know, I came out of nowhere. I mean, nobody knew who the hell I was. Um, Hone Tufare was, was around, and so was Patricia Grace and Roly Habib. When I first arrived, he said to me, Oh, Witty, you were still shitting in your nappies when we were writing. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, I guess that we are all, all of us have to be supreme commanders because, you know, we're um, going towards the future. And here in Nelson, what an amazing city. What an amazing city. I've, I've, as I was saying to you before, I saw through the streets, everywhere were these wonderful, wonderful graffiti, actually, you know, of Speak Māori on every wall around here. And it was just so terrifically splendid. And today we had a, um, a mihi for all of the artists um, done by Charlie. And I thought to myself, why aren't we doing this through the rest of the country? So, Nelson, whakatū, te nā koutou. Now, I know we shouldn't judge a book by its cover, but... Um, oh, please. <laughs> was this false advertising? Did people come expecting to see this guy? No, well, you know, honestly... Interviewed by someone a bit younger than myself. I didn't want that photograph on the cover. It's a beautiful photograph, though, isn't it? 
It's absolutely gorgeous. You're literally kicking up your heels. Do you recognize, tell me about this man here. Tell me that about, man. do you recognize this man? Well, he was 22 years of age and he didn't know what was going to happen in his life and he had been trying his very, very best to transform himself into somebody out of nobody. Um, he had come from a small village called Waituhi and I met um, today somebody who actually knows my sister. Because, you know, so that was really, really great. So he came from Waituhi, he ran away from home. His parents had certain expectations of him and he had expectations for himself. And at this age, at 22, he realised um, that um, the famous um, American columnist Ann Landers was absolutely right when she said that things are always darkest before they become totally black. <laughs> so, I thought that was going to have a happier ending than that. <laughs> so why not go for broke? <laughs> So I wrote my very first um, uh, collection of short stories. And this is the thing about being a writer, you have to be strategic in your career. So already I had my career mapped out, you know. I wrote a, um, a collection of short stories first, and then I wrote uh, a novel the next year, which was published the next year, and then I wrote another novel the year following that, and they were published one, two, three, bang, bang, bang. Which is not too bad for somebody whose very first short story, when I was 11, was Once Upon a Time. There was a princess, guarded by a fierce dragon, and every day she would see a handsome prince go by, and she would yell, help me, help me, save me from this dragon. But she was so ugly that the princes on their white horses would keep on riding further and further down the road to rescue a more beautiful princess. Every day this would happen, yet another handsome prince on a beautiful white horse, until she got so sick and tired of waiting that she went out and married the dragon. <laughs> What's the moral of that story? <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting that you ask, because I always used to say that story against myself. You know, it wasn't like Janet Frame's wonderful um, first short story about a bird flying out of the sun. And I, I used to kind of laugh at myself and say, well, you know, this is really where I'm from. But I met this um, academic from Germany, and he said, well, Mr. Himaira, this is a very interesting short story, because it's subversive. The princess is not beautiful, she's an ugly princess. The handsome prince is not doing what he's supposed to be doing, uh, rescuing her. Um, the dragon, she goes out and marries the dragon, so she leaves the land of safety and enters the land of danger. Very, very subversive, Mr. Ihimaira. <laughs> and so I think I've been writing the dragon all my life. And at that age, it's quite a compelling image. You were, you were scrawling on, on your bedroom wall, um, your, your writings. And so this is just, just me scrawling on my, you know, on paper. And most times when people want me to autograph my, my, my books, what I will do is I will say, oh, do you mind if I do some graffiti on my face? So I will probably put um, glasses on there and a moustache and little mukles around here because I'm allowed, yeah. you know, I am allowed. So all I've ever done is write on write on, on, on paper, write on walls, write everywhere where I can. And so there was this, um, this um, indigenous Inuit um, architect, very famous in Canada, called Douglas Cardinal. And he said to me, he said to me, you know, Witty, when you start a piece of work, it's already starting to write itself and exist in the future. And so I've always thought that when I start writing, it actually might start here, but I'm writing and it's existing it's existing in the, in, in the future, and that really thrills me, and that's what makes me able to go the distance of writing a bloody book as big as that, yeah. and of writing Māori Boy, the one before, and the one that's going to come. Yeah. Well, we'll get, we'll get to that, but perhaps um, we should um, hear a taste of, of your writing. Would you like to do a, a reading for oh, us? Oh, let's talk a little bit more. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I, you know, I haven't seen this boy you, for a long, long time and you know, I'm always in awe of, of Guyon because um, he has stamina and he has courage and it's all what we need if we are going to change the way in which Aotearoa is going. And I'm not only meaning that with respect to our bicultural um, nation requirement, I'm also meaning that in terms of um, gender as well and in terms of making sure that we grow up in an, in, in, in an inclusive society. <laughs> no matter your, uh, your, your mehi, um, we need to get on. Let's, let's hear. Let's All right. 
Okay. So this is really interesting because, I, you know, when you write, a <laughs> write something like this, you don't really want to do it because um, it means living your life again. Who wants to live your life again? And I've done it twice now. <laughs> so I've got a, a third one to go. So every time I do it, it's always with a lot of resistance. You should talk to Peter Jackson about this habit of yours. Is he, oh, that's right. With this, oh, he's yeah. to do everything in three. Well, you know, P Peter Jackson, move over, because I'm planning to do a, um, a Lord of the Rings Maori style, you know, in books. Really? Yeah, well, I, you know, I mean, I used to say when, when the books came out, um, well, you know, New Zealand. Can I just interrupt you? The, uh, Witty style is to is like the koru, and it, and it and it revolves around. So you're going to be going. Where are we going? Are we in the future? Are we? So it's, <laughs> it's going to be a bit of that, isn't it? Well, I guess it is. But um, you know, I mean, I used to say this is not. What did they used to call um, New Zealand when the Lord of the Rings books came out? Middle Earth. This is not middle. This is not Middle Earth. This is Maori Earth. <laughs> you know. Take and the time. thing about Maori, Maori history and Maori culture and, and, um, and uh, Maori economy, Maori geography, is that it's all around us. And so what I'm going to try and do with my next book, um, which is called Charting the Stars, we were talking about this, is to provide an opportunity for younger writers to, to think about the myths that they have grown up with around here and use those rather than the myths that have come to them and which we are getting through Taika Waititi's Thor and through the, the great and wonderful um, universe um, of um, all of those um, uh, cartoon uh, movies. We're getting pictures of myths from overseas. Man, oh man, they haven't heard anything until they've heard Māori myths. <laughs> you know, we've got Thor's galore in our, in our myths. Yes. My family needs this book, so please, um, please write it. February. But read from the one that you've written now. <laughs> February 1962. The future pivots. It pivots as mum and dad drive you to Gisborne Boys High School, where you are to enrol. If they had not persevered with you, your life might have been entirely different if they had not persevered with you, Witty, if you had not been persevered with. Other cars have gone through the entrance to the sunlit buildings beyond. Parked in the leafy shade, you sit silently in the cab of the truck between mum and dad. That way they can, they can make sure you won't do a runner. <laughs> then mum looks at her watch and then at your father. Well, dad, we can't sit here all day. In you go. Dad gets out and you join him, but mum stays in the truck. You walk through the sunlight to the headmaster's office. There are a number of other parents waiting with their sons. Dad gives the secretary your school records from your previous school, the church college. One by one, the other parents go in, and most return with relieved smiles because Sonny Boy is in. Half an hour later, it's your turn. The secretary takes in your documents. Five minutes later, she looks at Dad, Mr. Gray. We'll see you now, Mr. Smiler. Well, Jigger Gray is an imposing man. He's imposing, very imposing, Jigger Gray. He always wears his academic gown, surely a garment to intimidate the bravest heart. And he suffers no fools. No fools does he suffer. Dad is wearing a snappy fedora, which he takes off as you both enter. And the headmaster gets straight to the point. <coughs> I have re read the reports from your, schools, from your son's previous school, he begins. And he showed good grades there. However, given the school's teaching methods, I have to evaluate their reporting criteria as well as your son's reports. An American church school, wasn't it? I'm afraid I can't take a positive view. American schools, not good. <laughs> he gets up to shake Dad's hand goodbye, and this is the kiss-off. This is the kiss-off, Witty. You know it's the kiss-off. Dad refuses to budge from his seat, though or rise to shake Mr. Gray's hand. A New Zealand education is the right of every child, Dad says. The college recommended him for an American university, but Whitty decided to stay in New Zealand. He needs his UE, a New Zealand qualification, to go to Victoria. Victoria? Dad, you're jumping the gun. You're jumping the gun, Dad. Mr. Gray has taken aback. Did he think the subjection of a parent was going to be easy? Your son is not a child. 
Jigger Gray reminds Dad. He is 17, and if I admit him to the lower six, he will be joining pupils who are mostly 16. Show me, Dad says, in the education regulations, where an age limit is set for pupils entering sixth form. He is bluffing, he is bluffing. He knows he is bluffing. Mr. Gray knows he's bluffing. I know he's bluffing. <laughs> Mr. Gray's eyebrows arch, but he must admire Dad's attempt to finesse him. And there are, in fact, two others your age in 6B2 that year. But he's firm, he's not a man whose decisions are questioned. And he goes to the door and tells the secretary, send the next parent in, Mrs. Smith, and son in, Mrs. Smith. And as you and Dad pass him by, he says, I suggest, Mr. Smiler, that you take your child home to the farm and put an axe in his hands. He's had his chance. You've had your chance, Witty. You know it. You walk back to the truck. Dad reports to Mum. Well, dear, the headmaster won't admit, Witty. Your mother is made of sterner stuff. <laughs> you go right back in there, Tom. We are not leaving until Witty is enrolled. You return to Jigger Gray's office. Tell Mr. Gray that I am back, Dad advises the secretary, <laughs> Mrs. Smith. But the headmaster has many other parents to see, she explains. We will wait. Inspired by Mum's obstinance, Dad is really fired up. And the morning turns into a long procession of parents and pupils coming to see the headmaster. Dad overhears the secretary whispering to one of them, we have a very stubborn parent here and he will not take no for an answer. At midday, three hours since you got here, Mr. Gray appears at the door and is going to lunch, and he is clearly furious with you and Dad. He marches past and disappears. Maybe we could go and get some lunch too, Dad, you say to your father. Better not, Dad answers as he looks at Mum waiting in the truck. <laughs> she would not be happy if we left our post, and she is always to be obeyed. <laughs> I look out the window at her where she sits in the truck, she makes a sign, if you value your lives, you stay right there, Tom. <laughs> I sit down beside Dad again, bugger. <laughs> Lunch over, Jigger Gray returns. He goes into his room and shuts the door behind him, and then just as quickly he returns. His jowls are jiggling. He is clearly only managing to keep his temper under control. Then he lifts his hands in a sign of capitulation. All right, Mr. Smiler, I will allow your son to enroll. And he looks you straight in the eye. I'll be keeping an eye on you, young Smiler, and after the first term, we'll ask your teachers to give me a progress report. If you are not doing well or slacking and give me good reason to reverse my decision, and I hope you do, your feet won't hit the ground until you are on the street. He turns to Dad. Do we understand each other, Mr. Smiler? Dad shakes on the deal. Then good day to you, Mr. Gray says. With that, you and your father join Mum. Don't let the headmaster prove me wrong, which he, mum says. Beautiful. There was a, a suggestion there that um, you should have an axe in your hand, you, you should be a farmer or some, some such. But I've um, always uh, wanted to be a farmer. <laughs> all my life, all I've ever wanted to do is to have my own farm. All my life, even today. So fortunately, my sister still runs our family farm in Te Karaka, And there's nothing I love more than to get on our, one of our horses and just go around the farm. I just love the whole idea of seasons, of things changing, of pitching yourself against bad economics, actually. Because, you know, unless you're into, into milking, um, into dairying, then being a sheep farmer in the high hill country that we had on our farm is... It's not an easy job, but I've always wanted to be a farmer. So there's a story I tell, actually, of, um, in the book, which is one of the most wonderful stories that I associate with my dad, and that is that um, we were out lambing. And um, I'd never seen him do this before, but normally what you would do is that you would see which of the ewes were going to be coming to lamb, and then you would go out maybe early in the morning to help them, because you would have to pull them out. And so um, we had come across this particular sheep um, who was dead, this ewe, but the lamb was still alive. So Dad said, well, you know, you carry the lamb uh, over uh, on your horse. And then as we were, throughout the day, we 
we, we would see other lambs and we would help them, we'd pull them out and then, and then they would be alive. But then we came across um, a, a ewe that lamb had died. So Dad said to this one that I was carrying, oh, you know, there's your mum. And what he did was that the dead lamb, he got his butcher knife and he slit it from the neck down to um, its rear and then opened it up and did little, uh, little circles around here so that he could pull the whole coat off. And then he put it onto the, onto the live lamb and then pushed it to the mother, which would then smell the wool of, the, of, of, her, dead, of her dead child. And the dad was always like that. He always um, kind of like gave me lessons, you know, that um, despite adversity, that life goes on and that one should always, it doesn't matter what happens to you, and, because lots of bad things happen in our lives, you know, lots of tragedy. Um, and uh, like I can relate it also to, you know, to books, that um, as long as you just keep on trying to get over yourself enough to have the courage and the stamina to, to carry on and to grieve, certainly grieve, then, you know, you are giving life to something. Is that why you wrote this? Um, to come to terms with your own actually, struggle and journey? Yes, because I had written a book around about 2009, and, and there's, there's two copies over there. It's called The Trail in a Sea. And in 2009, I went through shit in this country. I mean, I almost felt like I, was, I should really emigrate and go to Australia, where they treated people better. Well, they've nicked all our other... <laughs> <laughs> But um, so I had um, television crews and and newspaper men and the, the listener doing articles about the um, level of um, of copyings that were in that particular book, and um, I knew that my career, if I didn't watch out, had completely gone down the toilet. Um, I met, um, I, and until then, I had been published by Penguin Books. And I met Harriet Allen in the street one day, and she said to me, I want to help you get out of this business, Wissy. So what I'll do is I will offer you the opportunity to, to do something different. So why don't we think about your doing um, a memoir series? Um, so I've done that. So those two books over there, they actually have come out of my house. In my house, there's a great big hole, um, um, cut, you know, um, lots and lots of, of copies. You I bought, bought them all, all back. Yeah. Yes, I did buy them all back. And every now and then I will go in there and I'll say a karakia for them and I'll throw water over them and say, I haven't forgotten you. You know, because books are like... I like to think that um, my, mine are books that you can hongi with. And so I go in there, I hongi the books, and I say, I'm sorry that I've done this to you and that you're still here. So hang on, you, 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 you literally want the reader to exchange breath with the book. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Every book that I write, I, I, I always imagine myself, the reader, and, you know, yes, ex exchanging breath. Because um, just like stars are not stars, they are gods. And just like when uh, Muri Ranga Whenua, um, she gave her um, grandson Maui a jawbone um, with which to belabor the sun, it wasn't just a jawbone, it was a new technology as well. It was all of her thoughts. A book is not just a book. You know, a book is the future. A book is the present. A book is the past. A book is a person. And with those ones, those ones there, um, um, he was a person who actually lived. So when all of that happened, I thought that I had created a very, very awful thing to him, um, the character in the book. Um, and that I now had to bring him home to my place and keep him in my place rather than where he should be doing his job for the Whanganui people out there in the world. I also wondered whether you'd um, written the book of your life to try to come to terms with the struggle of this man, this, what, 20 something man. Um, who was the first Māori novelist to be published in New Zealand, right? Um, to, to the man that you are now and, and the struggles that, that you had along the way. Um, was, was it cathartic in a way? Yes. Well, I still look like that, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, Your glasses it's, it's, it's interesting because it's... Janet Frame said something interesting, and that is that it wasn't until the moment of... Um, 
of actually putting her pen down um, on the page. She, she said that um, it is in some things, yes, about her phenomenal memory, because she wrote three um, memoirs. And someone asked her about um, that memory, and she answered, it is in some things, yes. I'm not particularly observant, but when I am writing, I have a clear observation of particulars I never knew I noticed. When Harriet asked me to do um, these um, series, um, she wasn't expecting these books, and neither was I, um, because I went deep into myself with them. And um, it's only when you get to the moment of Anayane, like although I had struggled and struggled and struggled to write Native Son, um, it really only was in the last six months or seven months of writing it that I thought I'll have to give up on myself and go to those other places because there's no doubt that what I went through was also part of becoming a writer, part of the strengthening um, that I had to, 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 um, um, to put myself through because I really did lack self-worth. I had no self-worth when I was 16. Well, should we, should we do another reading? You, you, because that probably relates to that, doesn't it? Okay. Yeah. 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 Well, I had really... This is a bit tougher, this one, isn't it? This will be a bit more confronting for, yeah. for the taranga up there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, then the, I, so then the thing was, should I do this? Should I go there? Because, you know, you and I, we're fathers as well as brothers, and we have family, and I now have grandchildren, and all I could think of was... Well, do I really want my grandchildren to, to know all of this, you know, that this is what Papa went through? Um, so you do have to really... They couldn't read the book, but I gave it to my daughters to read. I gave it to my wife to read. I gave it to everybody that I knew who was in the book so that they could understand that they were part of the, part of the memoir. Because clearly when you write a memoir, you're not writing about yourself. You're writing about the world that you live in. You're writing about the other people in the world. And they were as more to me, meant as much to me as anybody else. Like, um, the book is actually dedicated to my grandfather, but in the, in the very, very um, front of the book, there's also an acknowledgement of all of the mentors. And I've had so many wonderful mentors, and so I wanted them to know that I did not forget them. And I had written about my grandmother being raped as a child, um, and she um, had my... Um, my Auntie Mattie, and then Auntie Mattie had um, my cousin Billy. And the awful thing about all of that is that it just never goes away. You know, it's from generation to generation to generation. And then I had written about my mother probably being raped too as a child when she was 12 and she was looking after one of her aunties. And that was in the first book in Māori Boy. So when it came to this one, I really had to think, um, how can you possibly look yourself in the eye if you have already written about your grandmother being raped and your mother being raped? Why are you not prepared to engage in your own journey? So it was actually forced on me in the moment, in the spontaneity. So I wrote um, the book, really, regardless of all of the, of the research I had to do within, say, six or seven months. And I wrote it absolutely, totally in tears, because <laughs> there's still a young boy there that I still have to say, forgive me, for what he, what he had to go through. So it's really hard to come to places like this, because I just don't want it to go away. I just don't want to, I don't want to talk about it anymore, you know. But I'm trying to convey how my life was zigging and zagging between school, family, church, and my closest friend, Jackson. Spinning off its axis, it plunged into the perilous. My stress levels started going up and into the red, up and up and up, my stress levels up and into the red. And there came a moment in my life when, fueled by self-loathing, so much loathing, so much self-loathing, I hate myself. I had to find a way to obtain release. Thank God drugs were hard to get in Gisborne in those days. After all, this was still the early 1960s. Instead, Jackson, my friend Jackson, showed me how to use a razor. But I'm not blaming him. I'm not blaming you, Jackson. I'm not blaming you at all. Small, silver-edged, sharp a raisin was such a beautiful thing. It sliced, it opened. Just a little pain, but it gave the sense of punishment I so desired. 
I really needed it. I really needed to punish myself. I hadn't even heard of self-harm. Did it exist in those days? All I know is that really Jackson and I started to do it for laughs. And giggling, he demonstrated by cutting himself. Nothing to it, he said. I watched him, the orgasmic joy on his face. I wasn't the only one with demons, clearly. And then I tried it myself and found after the sting of the blade, the sting, that it was really comforting. It felt good to hurt myself and I knew I deserved it. I really did deserve it. You deserved it, would he? You'll forgive the lack of detail as I have spent many tri years trying to forget this part of my life, but whenever I succumbed to slicing my skin, there was first of all the pain and then a huge rush of elation. Chasing quickly after it, however, was depression and the need to cut again. And sometimes Jackson would cut me and I would cut him and I would cut him and he would cut me and he would cut me and I would cut him. Your turn now. It was a game I would never be able to tell when the pain would come, when he had control of the razor. And surprising ourselves, we would laugh and laugh and laugh and laugh and laugh and laugh and laugh. But afterwards, always the depression, the darkness would return and the blood pound in my temples. And I would think, I can't escape. The universe is determinate after all. And the razor's cut was also an act of bloodletting. Bloodletting. Panicking, I went through a period when I thought that my rapist spermatozoa was like a virus moving around inside me, eating up my universe, extinguishing the nebulae of my life. If I sliced my chest, my thighs, my arms, I might rid myself of them. Too late, stars began falling from the sky. There came an evening when the spores reached my dreams and struck. And a dawn blossomed around me and I heard chanting in the dark. I found myself in a lambic zone of myth and surreality, the Māori world of Moimoya. The dream was interlaced with the symbols and signs of our darker myths. A maelstrom of activity burst around me, terrorising and alarming. And I was at the centre of it. I was at the centre of it. Witty, you are here. I knew this dream. I had been to this place once before. My nights were times when my dreams often became nightmares and the worst ones came from the Māori world of Moimoya. And the sky was blood red and I was standing at the edge of a tall cliff and the wall was sheer black and a thousand miles below the sea of dreams was swirling, opalescent and luminous. An errant draught caught me and I began tumbling over and over and disoriented I saw the surface of the sea rushing up at me and then above and around were ponaturi, ponaturi, half avian, half fish, nightmare creatures, nightmare creatures, creatures from nightmare. Coming out of a blood red sun, they were half man, half avian, winged with clawed hands and quick winged, jagged as a bat. Well, quickly I forced myself awake, reached for the razor, sliced my chest. See, that didn't hurt at all, did it? The slice of the blade, the astonishment of the relief, the sharp pain brought, the beauty of blood, the bloodletting, the liquid redness and glow before the blood dried, rusted over, lost glamour, the desire to cut again. Oh, so good. And people were tumbling in the infinite air. We were a tangled mass of falling men and women, soundlessly screaming, screaming soundlessly. And then one of those ponaturi came diving. It came diving after me. Whimpering, I cut myself again. Come out, come out, come out. In a dazed moment, disoriented, I saw something perched on my bed looking at me. Hello, Witty, the Ponaturi said. That's a difficult passage for a question to follow. Um, but you've, I think, described your work as sometimes creating new mythology out of an old history. Is that... Is that what you do? Is that your, is that your mahi? Is that your work? Well, you know, my father always used to say, and I, I mentioned it to you at the back there, that um, we have to look to the future because tomorrow can take care of itself. So all of my mahi has been really to have these long-distance <laughs> eyes or vision 
And so I write for the kind of country, you know, that I want New Zealand to be and always have. What do you want New Zealand to be? Well, the black um, American writer James Baldwin, because, you know, the book is named after um, his book, Notes of a Native Son, and Richard Wright's book, Native Son. Well, he said of America in his book, Notes of a Native Son, I love America more than any other country in the world. And exactly for this reason, I insist on the right to criticize her perpetually. And so even though I've written wonderful um, I- inclusive novels like um, well, The Whale Rider, and so some of my books have been made into films, there is within me this need to con- continue to critique the trope of New Zealand and I will do so perpetually. I want to talk a little bit about having your work made in, into, into film because I, I spoke recently with Alan Duff, who I understand is yeah. a, a close friend of yours. Yeah. He, you're quite different. Um, you know, we're not actually because he, he, he came out of the same sort of background as I did, which was you know, of the sa- a similar sort of darkness with his, uh, you know, with his mother, whom I met and I really enjoyed her. We really got on like a house on fire. And uh, I could tell why, because, uh, you know, um, I might have been um, similar to, uh, to Alan and she could sense that there. And Alan and I also liked the same books. He likes um, Last Exit to Brooklyn. And I've always thought that Last Exit to Brooklyn is the sickest book that I've ever read. You know, and so it's really, it's really interesting whenever we get in, in, um, in conversation together. So, yeah. What was it like having... Whale Rider made it into film. To, so to, to yes. see that to see that yes. story, which must have lived okay. in your head and then lived on the page mm. and then lived on the screen. Yes. So um, Emma will know that we we are an evolving culture in New Zealand. I mean, look at the way we are now. It's totally different to what we were like ten years ago and twenty years ago and thirty years ago. So anything that I do now, I always think of as part of an evolving corridor. I talk, you talk, I talk, we talk, we all call it all, we all dance together, we all waltz together, generation to generation to generation. So with Whale Rider, for instance, Alan's um, um, film Once for Warriors had set the barrier very high and also had set a kind of uh, Maori story that was recognised um, around the world, and we were wanting to come along and write a nice, sweet story about a place called Fangara that nobody had ever heard of, that would follow after that. No shit, <laughs> you know, it would never ever happen. So John um, Barnett and I, we then decided that we would delay Whale Rider for eight years, because it was ready to come around about two years after Once for Warriors. And at that stage, we thought that maybe the whole wake of the Titanic of of uh, Once for Warriors had would have gone by then. Um, and at that time, there was no Māori film industry. So then the dilemma was, well, who would direct it? So there were around about four or five directors who could actually get pull in the money from overseas. And um, there, there are around about six or seven, actually, scripts done by those five or six um, um, directors. And in the end, Nikki Caro came up. And I said to Nikki, you know, Nikki, you're going to be really, people are going to badmouth you in the Māori community for making this film because you're not Māori. And she said to me, well, I'm a girl, I was a girl, and I recognise this girl's story. Will that do? (laughs) (laughs) And of course, you know, she was absolutely right. And she, what she did was that she turned the, um, the story into a movie that the world could walk into. It lacked the inscription that Māori people would have required. It lacked the language, it lacked the culture, it lacked the kaupapa, it lacked all of those things. And I got it in the neck too. I mean, you know, people would come up to me and say, what are you doing letting this Pākehā woman, um, you know, direct this film? What would you say to them? What would I say? I'd say, the world is an evolving culture. You bring bring a a Māori director, like Lee Tamahori was also... um, invited to do, the, to do the film. And I realised that for that time, that was the best, that we could, best shot we could give it. And what a bloody awesome shot that turned out to be. And then you, 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 can, look at the, you, you can look at its wake and know that it certainly did 
create a difference in um, Aotearoa. It certainly created a difference overseas because I would get emails and, and phone calls from people. Um, one of them was from uh, um, a young girl in Palestine and she, and she actually phoned me and she said, Mr. Ihimaira, I'm sitting in this open air theatre and I'm watching your film and there are helicopter gunships flying all around and all I can think of is that you show us a better world. You know, and then there was a young um, Chinese boy who um, uh, wrote and he said, I'm never going to treat my sister second class ever again. <laughs> you know, so in the general, um, it, it was a great, great success. In the specifics, um, because I'm still at that time when I, you know, I interrogate, 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 and always will be, I'm looking forward to Whale Rider, the Māori version. Now, Whale Rider, the Māori version might not be the same as, as Whale Rider, um, the John Barnett, um, Niki Karo, Witi Himaira version. But I'll tell you what, all of these things are all, are all um, choices that you make. There was, for instance, a choice that John and I had to make the film into um, a, a Disney movie with um, singing whales. I wasn't the one who said no to that one. I mean, it could have been Moana of those days. But uh, John said, no, we can't have that, because John was wanting to make sure that we established for ourselves um, a quality product. Yeah. You talk about um, a, a te reo Māori version, presumably, of, of Whale Rider. You did that magnificently, I thought, with um, Sleep Standing. And you collaborated with Hemi Kel Kelly on that. It's yes. an interesting story. You sort of... You, you, well, you tell it, but that story you, was one you prepared earlier, as the chefs say, wasn't it? Yeah, well, you know, I've always been opportunistic as a, as a writer, always. And um, Philip Temple, he once um, decided on uh, who should be in a literary first 15 for New Zealand. And he put me in at halfback. And I said, well, you know, why do you, why do you want to put me on, in at halfback? Because, you know, he had Morris G um, as a fullback. Um, he had... Who's the lock in this team? <laughs> oh, the lock was um, uh, Mr Jones. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah he was yeah. the lock. He, he would have been a great lock. So Bob Jones is the angry coach or Lloyd, something. Lloyd, yeah. <laughs> oh, I know, but yeah, yeah, yeah. So I asked him why he had put me on there, and he said, well, you know, Witty, you're opportunistic, you're slippery behind the scrum, and you sell the perfect dummy. <laughs> and honestly, in my career, that's really, you know, what I've ever done. So Hemi Kelly came to me from university, his university, and said... Um, there's no materials for uh, my students. Um, and so I'm wondering if you had um, a short story of mine that I could, uh, of yours that I could translate. And so that was Sleep Standing. It was a beautiful course. story, if you haven't read yeah. it. Yeah. Mm. And it's, and it's um, just to explain, it's, it's, it's in Reo Pākehā. One side of the Kititaha or Tafarangi, one side is um, English and the other side is Māori. So yeah. you're practising your reo. Yeah, so he, he, he came to me and asked me, and I said, I haven't got anything here that would be appropriate and then when he left I thought well actually there was this one that I had written around about five years ago but because that's out of my tribal affiliation I'm not affiliated to Ngāti Mani Oporto I just put it to one side and just thought well you know maybe one day when I'm dead someone will find it and they will publish it but then he came I sent him an email and said well you know there is actually this piece and you because you're from Ngāti Mani Oporto you will validate our using it so would you like to do it, um, re, um, or translate it into uh, Te Reo, and it had to be Ngāti Maniaporto dialect. Well, what pisses me off about his translation is that it's actually better than the English. <laughs> it is pretty good, the bits that I could get. But it's more than just a story, to, though, too, isn't it? Because it's, well, it's history as well, isn't it? And you're bringing to life those pakanga, those battles, and the stories that we're... What have we promised to do? Teach ourselves our history in, what, three years' time or something? Is that, is that the deal? Yeah. So we finally got around to this in 2022, I think, we'll be starting to teach our history in schools. So Which I've now I've become the patron of, a, of yes, an organisation yes. called 100 Books in Te Reo. And our aim is to publish 100 <laughs> books into Te Reo within 10 years. Um, and so one of our first books is, that's going to be coming out in Te Reo is Harry Potter. 
another one of the it's another one my family needs my my, <laughs> my six nearly six year old is over there is already into well, it's had it's I known that Harry Potter moment. was going to be so so fascinating and, and, and great I would have written the bloody thing myself <laughs> I'm opportunistic that way what other um, what, just just quickly on the because I'm getting quite excited about the 100 books what else are you lining up because we'll open it for questions soon so but but um, what else are you lining up for the 100 books um, Okay, so um, just two weeks ago, I suggested to the board that what we really needed was 100 books. I mean, I mean, within the 100 books framework, a series on tribal histories, and so these will be there'll be one for um, South Island. Um, though, of course, Tito, who um, has its own um, interesting eight tribal groups here, which is amazing. And you can understand why they all wanted to come to um, this part of the island. Uh, and so it will have whakapapa, it will have genealogy, it will have maps, it will have illustrations, uh, it will have biographies, it will have all of those sorts of things that our children need to be able to learn their history. And um, so, so far, um, the one for Kaitahu will come first and then the one for um, up north will come second. It's exciting. Um, you guys have got questions, eh? Yeah, I'm already getting some, some nodding of heads. We've got a, um, a microphone here. What, what's the kaupapa here? Do, we, do they come, or do you come to them? Yeah, okay. Who's first? We've got it. We'll open it up now, and um, if you're too whakama, then I'll ask some more. Oh, here we are. There's a question already. See? Um, tenet, tena, tena koto katoa, tene te mihi atukia iti, tene te mihi atukia na gayan, uh, komari aho. Um, iti, it's the first time I've heard of your, the books and the stories, but have you come to terms now of the journey that you've been, every, you, when you wrote those books, or have you, you like a sort of a closure or something of the past, or you never, or you, you just keep drawing back, drawing from that past to write your books? Well, you know, I mean, some people thought I was crazy when I wrote one book, <laughs> one memoir, and then with this one, I mean, who would want to live your life over twice? You know, but every time, um, I'm not actually writing them about myself, really, you know. I'm, um, so in the book, you know, um, I shift registers all the time. It will be, you do this, or I do this, or he does this, so I'm constantly trying to, you have to be very fast to catch up on me, with me, and even in my life, you know, if you can stay with me, then, then, then you're doing really well. It's a quick halfback. Yes, <laughs> yes, I have come to terms with um, this particular issue, and I, I came to terms uh, with it, um, um, and my grandfather, because a lot of these uh, are memoirs about how you can... You live without, we live with our ghosts, actually. Um, there was uh, the poet, um, T.S. Eliot, who said something like that, you know, that um, one lives with one, one ghosts and one carries them with you all the time. And so they are in my brain, they're in my head, they scrape my skull out, they sometimes laugh with me. Um, if if um, you're lucky enough to sleep with me and you hear me laughing at night, it's because I'm having a good joke with all of these ghosts, you know, we're having a great joke. But yes, I have come to grips with that. With number three, that's actually going to be a difficult one to negotiate because everyone who writes a memoir should actually negotiate what they are with your family. And by that stage, Ben and James and Aria, who are my grandchildren, will be old enough for me to be able to say, so, grandchildren, beloved grandchildren, most beloved grandchildren, this is about the time that your father left your grandmother. And he fell in love with a man. And he lived with that man for nine years. And through that, he also began to have to breathe deep in other ways. Because I'm not afraid to show people who I am. I mean, I know myself anyway. So I'm not afraid about that. But I am concerned sometimes because as you may or may not know, the memoir is not like a novel, you can't hide yourself. 
And nor can you, if you are honest with yourself, um, anesthetize your life. Otherwise, in your, in, in, if you do that in your book, you may as well do it to yourself, you know. Just fill yourself up with Novocaine and just, you know, just forget about who you really are. I've been so fortunate with, to have a dad like mine, you know, who just kept on saying, oh, and also, you know, we've got these people like Catherine Mansfield, you know, what is the hardest thing on earth for you to do? Tell the truth. Tell the truth, tell the truth, you know. So, um, I am, you have to be unafraid, and I have been unafraid, but there are nights when I go to bed and I just curl myself into a little ball and say to myself, What have you done? What have you done? And that's when I need somebody to come and hug me, because even though I am brave and even though I'm strong, and um, I will get through, you know. I, I, it, it will be something, you know, that um, th this is going to last for hundreds of years, you know. However, you have to look after the, the future. Um, tomorrow will take care of itself. While you guys are thinking about it, um, can we talk a little bit about the, the actual... I always like to ask writers how they write. Um, it might sound a silly question, but physically, you know, do, do you... You talked about being a kid and scrawling on the walls and scrawling on paper. How do you write nowadays? How does it work? Do you get up at the same time? Do you have to... You tell me about your, your process. Well... We have a saying, it is he iti hoki te mokokoa, nana i kakata te kahikatea, which is that the caterpillar may be small, but it gnaws through the kahikatea tree. <laughs> so I've often thought of myself as being a caterpillar, you know, and there's this kahikatea and that I gnaw through it. So it has to be done every day. If you don't do it every day, then you lose the consistency and also the sweetness of the kahikatea that keeps you going, you know. And also the strength that the kahikatea gives to your jaws if you're a caterpillar, you know. So I always sometimes think of myself as being this many-legged caterpillar and it's chewing away and thinking, oh, this is sweet, I'll go on to the next stalk and then go on and on and on, you know. So you have to have that stamina, you have to have that kaupapa, and then once you've got that kaupapa, when you say to yourself, I will do this, understand that it is already starting to exist in the future and that all you have to do is to write from here to there. So then it's laying down what Māori call the ara or the highway, and then I'm making sure that that highway has got um, a taproot or a pūrāko that goes from you into your culture so that you are fed from, from there, um, that it has... Um, something like um, um, those things that we always require to make us healthy, which is aroha, which is whānau, which is whenua, all of those things inside. So it's always about psyching myself up from a Māori point of view and then applying what I've learned in terms of European technique. So we have, for instance, um, the text, which is what I write about, and then as I'm writing it, I think about the context, that is the world that it's in. And then I think about the pretext, what is it that will motivate um, the story? And then I will think about the urtext, which is the legendary text. For instance, I use a lot of Greek mythology in mine. And then there's the textuality, so you know, I'm constantly building and building and building the text. And then you put your pen to the paper. So my brain is now saying to my hand, OK, so you know what you're supposed to be doing. Supposed to be doing, and then you take four years. <laughs> oh, that's and the kahikatea tree goes <laughs> I'm just listening to you th thinking how did you nearly fail school cert because <laughs> you got you, you, didn't you, you passed by one mark or something and, and life could have been very different life would have been very different well all of my life has been a struggle because um, I just well you know I mean it's really crazy because even at university um, it was uh, so long to talk took me to get nine years, and I got through with a very bad BA. 
and was C for coconut passes. And so <laughs> my father, when I told him, well, you know, Dad, I finally got it, and he, he sent me a little uh, email saying, oh, congratulations, son, a telegram saying, congratulations, son, about time. Even the tortoise didn't take this long. Yeah. Well, you're the caterpillar, aren't you? So. Well, yes, I didn't tell him about the caterpillar no. part. OK, I'll hog all the questions. Here we go. OK. Ahi, ahi, māori, witi and gaion. Um, I've read your book and it's very immersive in a Māori world and the style, the koru. But the thing that really made me go, wow, these guys are so different, was when your father and your uncle came to visit you when you had just moved in with Jane. And I wonder if you could share that with the audience. I don't have to find it in the book. If you could just tell that story, it made me think, there are completely, entirely different people living in this country that we've come to share with them. Well, there's some magnificent photographs in, in the book because when I wrote it, Guy On, I, you know, because I've had a very, very distinctive life and I married a Pākehā girl, or she married me, and she made my life into... Then, and then we had children. And then from those children, we now have these grandchildren who have the opportunity to be anybody that they want. You know, like um, Sir Tiffany O'Regan um, has said that um, I realised his father had told him that, uh, you know, um, because you had both Māori and, uh, and Pākehā ancestry, that didn't mean to say that um, your um, possibilities were cut in half. They were doubled. So when I married Jane, my possibilities doubled because in terms of whakapapa, then my children would have access to this wonderful wide world as well as to, to my world. And so those photographs and, and the book also then traverses the history of a bicultural family growing up in New Zealand that we can put against Catherine Mansfield's Burnell family, who, who, who stood for colonial New Zealand. So mine stands for the mid um, 20th century Pākehā Māori family growing up and, 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 and crossing all of those boundaries. So my father came to see me during that night. And, <laughs> Gee, you know, he would just turn up any old time, and my sisters and I, we had this, um, this system whereby they would ring me up and they would say, batten down the hatches, your father's going to turn up at any minute, because he would never tell us, you know, he would just arrive. And he didn't tell us, and so fortunately, even though um, Jane and I weren't married, you know, we were okay, I heard this car coming and I heard the, this <coughs> which is what my father always used to do, and then he'd come in. And he had a friend with him, Jim, Jim Leach. And so I said to Dad, well, what are you doing here? You know, you come to make a nuisance of yourself in, in the big city. And so he then proceeded to cook up this huge meal of tripe. <laughs> and I've, I've written in the book that um, I'm sure that the whole of Wellington was asphyxiated <laughs> that night by Dad and his tribe. But it was an example of, of how wonderful my father was. And in that whole um, section, he, he, he goes over what is happening at home, what is happening to the family land, what is happening to Fano, who has died, who hasn't died, because he was so upset that I was not, you know, not keeping up to date and in touch with the family at home, which has always been the dilemma for all of us as we traverse. We have to keep, we have to keep pulling our people together with us and going forward into the future. So there's something about that that I would really like to say before we, before we finish, and that is that I met this wonderful, wonderful um, academic, and her name was Katarina Graysharp. And you know, today, today there's so much facing the world, isn't there? You know, there's not only the climate crisis, because it is a climate crisis, and I'm so pleased that there are young students here, because in many ways, we have dropped the ball, guy on, and they're the ones who are picking it up. So all of the young students here, I take my hat off to you. Um, so your job is to break the calabash, what Māori call break the calabash. Forget about this older generation, just break the calabash and go for it the way in which you want to do it. Don't think about patriarchy, don't even think about matriarchy. Just go for it, because 
the future is closing. So this is what this woman, this young, this young um, <coughs> academic told me. She said that the potential of the wā, or the Pacifica wā, has continued to pour out of te kore, the abyss of primal creation. So for a young person, what you have to do is you have to turn in the direction that the wā is flowing, which is forward. And you must address the globalizing forces of our world by taking responsibility, as you already are doing. And you have to consider yourself hero kōtahi, as if you are a feather or a leaf, signifying the whole of the tree or the whole of the plumage. And then second, you have to think tai pākoro, to accept the burden of being heavily laden and suffering, because such knowledge, such responsibility, generates the compassion required to assist the wā, the continuance of all of the energy flowing from te pō to te ao, to, te ao, to today's, um, today's um, position. And then Katarina said that the main thing is to be brave and to stand on the porch, the threshold of the present, the threshold of the present, and make your karanga to the future. Your request to the future to receive you. And then as the feather or the leaf to join other Māori, Pacifica and Pākehā of your generation in mobilising the kaupapa together so that the bird, you with your feather and with many of the other younger people with their feathers can flock so that you with your leaf can join with others of of who are also leaves to grow with that forest to ensure that that portal will always be open. So all of my work is to make sure that that portal to the future remains open. Nga mihi ki ākoe mō tō kōrero. A lovely place to end it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. And a big thank you to, to you, Guy On, for chairing today's session. Um, I'm so delighted we've recorded this and that the podcast is available. You, you express so many beautiful ways about what a memoir is that I want to go back and listen to all of them and, 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 and enjoy them again. Thank you very much. Wissing. Oh, and I'm sure you um, can twist his arm to sign some books. Oh, um, of course. And I was just about to say, and, and if you'd like to come down I'm here and twist, buy some. I'm going to yeah. twist your arm and say, where's my Waiata group? Oh. Can... Can someone join me in singing a waiata? What should we sing? <laughs> Tell, come and yeah, Please, come and join me. <laughs> I just I'll come around here. shy on my own. So. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so these are all of the iwi from this festival. <laughs> I thought this was so tremendous because you never find another festival that it's, has its own waiata group. If you, if, if you um, read um, Native Son, you'll find that there is one particular waiata that I always sing to the young boy, to the young boy in the book. Po kare kare na wai o toru 
You're listening to the 2019 Nelson Arts Festival, Page and Blackmore, Puka Puka Talks. <laughs> 